Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and going over, Solomon talks about the vanity of pleasure, the vanity of personal accomplishment, just uh, life is vanity without God involved, that's basically what he's saying. <coughs> Excuse me, you'll notice here in... Uh, Ecclesiastes 2, verse 4, he says, I made me great works, I builded me houses. I made me great works, I builded me houses, plural. I planted me vineyards, plural, made me gardens, plural, and orchards, plural, and planted trees in them of all kind of fruits. I made me pools of water, water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. Verse 4 begins the royal uh, resume of Solomon's accomplishments. In this verse, we find that he spent a great deal of time building things. Solomon loved to build. If you've ever built or made something, you know the satisfaction that comes from your accomplishments. Solomon had a passion for erecting magnificent buildings. Solomon accomplished a great deal in his lifetime in the matter of construction. He was a competent and excellent builder. These construction projects were so massive that only a wealthy and great man could even attempt them. The scope of Solomon's grand achievements is indicated by the fact that everything occurs in the plural form in these verses I just mentioned. Houses and vineyards and gardens, uh, trees and pools. And in 1 Kings chapter 7 and 9, provide information about his construction projects, as well as 2 Chronicles chapter 8. And uh, it took 13 years to build his own house. The wood came from the forest of Lebanon. It was 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet tall. That means the bottom floor alone was around 11,250 square feet. If it was a multi-level home, it had three, possibly four stories. It took 20 years to build the Jewish temple and the palace. He constructed a porch of pillars that was 75 feet long and 45 feet wide. A hall of judgment was built. He built a home for his wife from Egypt, the daughter of Pharaoh. All these buildings were made with expensive and cut stones that were used in the foundation all the way to the roof. The stones were as big as 15 to 12 feet in length. Uh, many were cut from Solomon's underground quarries throughout Jerusalem. One of the quarries is called Zedekiah's Cave. Uh, there's people that's been there and seen this. It's huge, uh, according to the testimonies. He helped to construct and finish the walls of Jerusalem. Fortresses, storage cities, chariot cities, cities for his cavalry, and defense cities were built by him all throughout Israel. He built a navy that was used to transport goods, including building materials, food, costly stones, and gold from Ophir, O-P-H-I-R. In spite of all that, in spite of all that he accomplished, Solomon said it was all vanity. And it was like chasing the wind in verse 11, Psalm of Solomon 2.11. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. We went over this. Behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Because he left God out of it. See, there's nothing wrong with having nice things as long as God's in it. Yep. See? There are some people in this country and throughout the world that are saved, born-again people, and they have a lot of nice stuff. All right, but they know, they know how to keep God first. They can keep God first. And uh, a lot of people can't do that. A lot of people, God starts breathing on their life a little bit, financially or possession-wise or material-wise, and they get all out of whack. And uh, their flesh just goes crazy. And uh, they're out of church, and they're not serving God and everything else. 
And uh, so he said, uh, wrapping your life up in things will never satisfy you as long as the Lord is left out of your life. That's where Solomon made his mistake, and he brought problems upon himself and the nation. After Solomon completed the temple and the palace, the Lord appeared to him a second time. God told him if he would obey the Lord and walk in his commandments, he would establish the throne of Solomon's kingdom in Israel forever. If Solomon or his descendants turned against God and worshipped pagan gods, then Israel would be cut off of the land in 1 Kings chapter 9. Solomon did turn to idols. We showed you that a few weeks ago. I mean, he committed idolatry big time. The kingdom was divided after he died, and eventually the nation was carried off into captivity by the Assyrians and Babylonians. When Christ is brought into the picture, <laughs> construction or building takes on a new purpose and meaning. Christ can help you to be an effective builder, leave you happy, satisfied, and fulfilled. The key is what you set out to build. Spiritual construction leads to fulfillment and blessing. <clears throat> Just a few things about building. We're to build our lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ by serving and working for Christ in some way. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15 talks about the judgment seat of Christ. You realize as soon as you got saved, if you're born again, you started building on that foundation. And you started building it. You want to build precious stones. You don't want wood, hay, and stubble. Uh, you want, uh, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones. And then he said, wood, hay, and stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. This is a reward. This isn't talking about going to heaven. You don't get to heaven by building and doing right and doing good deeds. This is about a Christian building upon a foundation. You're building upon your own foundation. Yep. I can't build upon your foundation. You can't build upon mine. And so our foundation is what we're building upon Christ, and we're building about our concerning our obedience, our faithfulness, all that type of thing, see? And that all plays into it, and uh, what kind of a building we have when we get at the judgment seat. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Not loss of salvation. That's loss of reward. That's what he's talking about, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11 to 15. And uh, so then secondly, you're to build your life by obeying what God has said in his word. He's our rock. All right, so that's Matthew 7, 24 to 27. It talks about, Jesus talks about uh, a wise man building upon a rock, his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Your life is a spiritual house. The Spirit of God indwells every Christian. We're to use our lives to honor God with praise and living that is acceptable to Him. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16 and 17. Also 1 Peter 2, 5, Ye also as lively stones are built up, a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And then we're to build up our lives spiritually by walking with God, growing close to Him, putting Him first in our lives, being grateful to the Lord and living by faith in Him, as Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. And then answered prayer will build your faith in God. In Jude 20 and 21, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Building up yourselves. Praying. He talks about that. How do you build it? One of the ways you build yourself up is by prayer. And then we're to build up other believers by encouraging them to live for Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. If there's ever a day in time, folks, people need encouragement, it's today. Yeah. I mean, we all need to encourage each other to live for God and to edify one another. I read this. Uh, there's a tremendous power in encouragement. WBZ Television out of Boston, Massachusetts, released this story on August the 18th, 2019. <laughs> they said that Henry Fras Frasca, 
was a diehard Boston Red Sox fan. But the nine-year-old boy was a baseball lover first. As he watched the Baltimore Orioles first baseman, Chris Davis, struggle through a historically awful 0 for 54 slump at bat. 0 for 54, not one hit in 54 at bats. We're talking about professional baseball player. He decided to offer a message of support. I know this is not a worldly illustration, but it shows you something about encouragement. Henry wrote a letter, nine-year-old Henry wrote a letter to Davis telling him, don't give up, and give it to a, he gave it to a coach to bring it to him when the Orioles visited Boston on April 13th. Davis read it and broke his streak in his next at-bat. On Saturday, Henry and Davis met for the first time as Baltimore returned to Fenway Park in Boston. Davis said he's kept, he's kept the note with him inside his Bible. The note read like this. There are two things I want you to know this nine-year-old boy told me. First, the way you play baseball has nothing to do with how good a person you are. But also, you've been so good. You have played in Major League Baseball. You are great. Don't give up. We are rooting for you. Davis said, I'd be lying if I said I didn't get a little choked up. Henry got to spend some time with Davis and chase fly balls in the outfield even throwing one over the green monster, the giant wall in Fenway Park's outfield. Henry said to Mr. Davis, thank you for the best day of my life. Davis said Henry's kind gesture was something he'll never forget. He said, I think a lot of times people don't realize how much they impact us. At that moment in time, going through what I was going through, to get a letter that was that encouraging and from a nine-year-old boy, he said it was pretty special. A nine-year-old boy was able to encourage a professional baseball player. You might say, preacher, I can't encourage nobody. I'm nobody. You are somebody. You can encourage somebody. Amen. Yeah. So the encouragement of this young boy strengthened this man when he needed it. And then uh, Solomon says here in, in uh, chapter 2, verse 4, I made me great works. I built me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to put water there with the wood that bringeth forth trees. In order to find the satisfaction that Solomon was seeking in life, Solomon was not only a builder, he was a farmer as well. Planting lush vineyards and gardens, beautiful parks and orchards that yielded a, a bounty of beauty in the spring as the trees blossomed. Trees yielded their fruits that would provide food for his family and workers in the kingdom. The fragrance from the flowers perfumed the breeze with a sweet bouquet. Irrigation pools were constructed to water all these gardens and crops. The engineering and manpower to accomplish these tasks were incredible. There were three key reservoirs. The most impressive one was southwest of Bethlehem in Etham. It had an uh, aqueduct that led to Jerusalem. According to the research of archaeologist Edward Robinson, these pools were absolutely huge. The first to the east was 582 feet long, 207 feet wide, and 50 feet deep. The second pool was 432 feet by 250 feet and 39 feet deep. The third reservoir was 380 feet by 236 feet and 25 feet deep. Much of the land was dry, and he converted it into growing ground. He called these vineyards, orchards, crops, and gardens great works. He said, I made me great works. And I'm sure they were. But these accomplishments did not satisfy Solomon and give him the fulfillment he was seeking because God wasn't included. <laughs> he was committing idolatry and gotten away from God and everything else. See, if God isn't involved, it's vanity and it's like chasing the wind. When we bring the Lord into the picture, the matter of cultivation changes. God desires to develop fruit in our life. You are the one, however, that will need to make the effort to grow spiritually and choose to serve the Lord. 
What fruit is the Lord trying to produce in your life? So, uh, God wants us to bear fruit. Uh, there's the fruit of soul winning or winning people to Christ. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. Uh, there's the fruit of spiritual growth and maturing in Christ. Uh, Romans 6.22 and 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. The fruit of the Spirit of God's traits. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. There's the fruit of supplying others' needs. Romans 15, verse 26 and 28. There's the fruit of service and working for Christ. Colossians 1, 10. There's the fruit of speaking praises to God. You say, where's that at? Hebrews 13, 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Boy, what a wonderful name he has. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. The fruit of shunning sinfulness and shame. Matthew 3, 8. Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meet for repentance. So, uh... We have our days of victory and fruitfulness and our days of defeat and barrenness. There is a constant tug of war taking place in our souls for control. It's a battle between our selfish, sinful nature and the Holy Spirit. Whomever we yield to gets the victory and the other one loses. Then in verse 7 he starts, I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. We went over this a little bit. Also, I had great possessions. I'm just going into more detail now. I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I mean, he had more cattle possessions than everybody is before him. I gathered, verse 8, me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. I mean, he had a great big orchestra. He had all kinds of musical instruments. I mean, this guy is loaded. He's a king. Verse 9, so I was great and increased more than all that was before me, that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from. In other words, whatever my eyes wanted, I got it. Imagine that. Imagine whatever your eyes wanted, you're allowed to have. You can get it. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Whatever Solomon wanted, he got. It. He denied himself nothing. He purchased slaves to do the work of what he dreamed and to take care for his needs at home. He had so many that the queen of Sheba was impressed by the organization, effectiveness, and appearance of his staff and attendants in 1 Kings 10, verse 5. <coughs> he indulged in being a rancher he was a rancher, uh, purchasing cattle to meet the dietary needs of those that he cared for daily. Each day his requirements for food included 10 fat, fattened oxen and 20 oxen out of the pastures, according to 1 Kings 4.23. Every day was like a barbecue. If he wished, he could have had steak every day for every meal. <clears throat> he enjoyed the finest foods. The historian Josephus stated that the king had a thousand or more chariots and 20,000 horses. The drivers and riders were young men of comely aspect, tall and well made. They had long flowing hair, wore tonics of Tarian purple, and powdered their hair with gold dust, which glittered in the rays of the sun. Solomon also sought satisfaction in accumulating gold, silver, and precious jewels. Listen to these verses. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. Beside that, he had of the merchant men and of the traffic of the spice merchants and of all the kings of Arabia and of the governors of the country. And King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went to one target 
and he made 300 sh uh, shields of beaten gold. Three pounds of gold went to one shield, and the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold. That's in 1 Kings 10, verses 14 to 18. 1 Kings 10, 14 to 18. The weight of gold Solomon received each year was 666 talents, or 49,950 pounds of gold. This was 1,000 years ago. In today's gold price of $1,613 per ounce, that was as of last year, early of last year, that would be, let's see, uh, one billion two hundred eighty-nine million one hundred nine thousand. <clears throat> That's a lot of money for today, let alone back then. Solomon used the gold to adorn his throne. Gold was used to cover five hundred shields. His wealth was enormous. Silver was as common as stones in Jerusalem. You know, and studying all this stuff these last few weeks, I, I, I got thinking about it the other day. I thought, in studying for this here, I thought, because it says in 2 Chronicles 1.15, and the king made silver and gold at Jerusalem as plenteous as stones. The king made silver and gold at Jerusalem as plenteous as stones. Many people hoard money today, placing their security in these things and believe it will solve their problems. I gotta think about all this and all these verses in King, first and second Kings and Chronicles and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and all these things about Solomon. I thought, God, why do you have so much in here about Solomon and all his riches and all his wealth and all the his all the wives and the wine and the orchards and the vineyards and the all the pools and the different things that he made, everything that he had. I believe one of the main reasons why is God knows that human beings, the average human being in America and around the world for thousands of years now, think that what will make them happy is a lot of material possessions and a lot of money. Now, there's nothing wrong with having nice things. I've mentioned many times. And having a lot of money if you keep God first. Yeah. If you keep God in it. And... Uh, I, I think I told you this. Uh, uh, years ago, I was, when I was down south there in Georgia there, me and the preacher, the pastor of the church down there, uh, we went, uh, we, we was down in Florida at a meeting there, and this Christian businessman, he worked for Merrill Lynch, and he worked for him for years. The guy was loaded, him and his wife, and uh, he's probably, at that time, this is back in the early 90s, he was probably 64, 65, 62, 65, if you there. And uh, that was back then. And uh, he got some big check, he, told, he was telling the pastor there and I, he got some big check and nobody even expected it for some, some you know, Merrill Lynch, some, some stock or whatever it is, I don't know. And uh, he, 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 said, he said, Brother Homer, he said, I... He said, I got a check in the mail. And he said, this guy gave a ton to the church, gave a ton to missions, gave a ton, and uh, helped a lot of different missionaries out, missionary projects through the years, and, and uh, been on the mission field and different things, and really had a burden for, God, for the work of God. And uh, he was telling about how God blessed him. He wasn't saying it in a braggadocious way or nothing. If you seen this guy, you would think he had five cents in his pocket. I mean, he just had a pair of, I mean, he, you know, decent looking clothes, but I mean, just kind of like, just an average looking shirt, an average different, uh, average pair of pants. And uh, of course, at that, that, that time we went out, he had a suit and tie and everything on. But uh, you see him, if you see him out, you know, away from church and stuff, you think he was just some, you know, a guy just living out on a farm somewhere. And just, I mean, this guy was loaded, but you know what? He loved God. He loved God. Now, I know some people, or know of some people, who are rich, but they're not saved. So everything they do is based on the world. Under the sun, like Solomon says here in Ecclesiastes. Everything is about what they want to do for their own profit, for their own good, generally. And, uh, I mean, once in a while, they might help somebody out or something. But it's for them, you see. 
And, and there's nothing wrong with using money for yourself and your needs and things like that. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that it's just different when God is in control. Yeah. It's different when God is first in your life. It's just different. And God will just keep blessing you. And just keep blessing you. And, uh, but I say, God, how's come, how's come all this stuff in here about Solomon? I, I believe it's because God wants the world to see a man who had everything that most people want. All right? Uh, he had all this wealth and material possessions, 700 wives and 300 concubines. He had wine, wealth, women, money, orchards, pools, houses, land, property. He had everything. And he said, what's he saying? Chapter 2, verse 17, therefore I hated life. How could a man like that hate life? When God isn't involved, that's what happens. There's an emptiness. There's a void. There's vanity. There's futility. I wish people in America could get that. Amen? I wish they could get that. I wish a lot of Christians could get that. I've seen Christians since I got saved. You wouldn't believe some of the things that get some of God's people out of church. It's absolutely amazing. Amazing to watch the devil do it. And uh, it's absolutely amazing. All right, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and uh, verse 11. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexatious spirit. There was no profit in the sun. We got down to further than that. Verse 12. And I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly, for what can the man do that cometh after the king, even that which hath been already done? And uh, I think, I believe we went over that. And uh, let's see here. And then verse uh, 13. Verse 13. Ecclesiastes 2, 13. Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly as far as light excelleth darkness. I wonder that. I think verse 14 is where we stopped last time. Uh, no, we got down... 15, then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. What happens? Verse 14, death. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness, and I myself perceive also that one event happeneth to them all. That one event, according to chapter 9, verse 3, is death. In uh, Ecclesiastes uh, 9, verse 3, this is an evil among all things that are done in the sun, that there is one event unto all, yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil and madness is in their heart while they live, and after that they go to the dead. I was thinking the other day, I mean, I'm not trying to be mean, but I think I think about people that have died. I think about I think about Kobe Bryant here last year, a couple years ago. Him and his daughter died in that plane wreck. I think I mentioned that before. The guy's a multimillionaire. Now his wife's got all his millions. And uh, she's, she's suing the uh, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department out there is saying they, should, they shouldn't have been up in a helicopter that morning, Sunday morning, uh, because of the, the uh, fog and everything, and she's trying to get more money out of the city of Los Angeles. It's never enough. Never enough. Uh, th this is the whole theme of this book here. Ecclesiastes 2.17, Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. For all his vanity and vexatious spirit. It's grievous because he's not with God. He got away from God. When a person isn't saved and serving God and has the joy of the Lord in their heart, we're not talking about being perfect. Nobody's perfect. But we're, you're either walking in communion with, communion with the Lord or you're not. It's not a matter of being perfect. It's a matter of you're in fellowship with the Lord or you're not. And, and you can be in fellowship with the Lord. And... Uh, so, uh, how can a rich man hate life in verse 17? Therefore, I hated life because he found out that riches don't give or produce life. All right. Solomon is in love with what he has, and to him it's vexatious spirit, vanity to leave it to somebody else. If you fall in love with God, 
then when you die, you aren't leaving what you love. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Colossians 3, 2. Jesus said, lay not for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In Matthew 6, 19-21. That really, he's going to leave him to Rehoboam, his son. And he acts like you don't even want to leave it to him. Because he says in verse uh, 12, and I, also, and I turn myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. Watch this. For what can the man do that cometh after the king? He's told by his son Rehoboam. Even that which hath been already done. And uh, 16, for there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. In other words, the wise and the fool are really the same. They both die. One just had a lot more material possessions than the other one did, but neither one of them, you know, I mean, they're both going to die. So Solomon says, I'm wise, and I got all this money. Yeah, but you're not right with God, Solomon. You committed idolatry. See? And, uh, and then verse 18, Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. There's, he's talking about Rehoboam, his son. All right? Uh, shall leave it to the man that shall be after me. 19. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? In other words, I don't know whether Ray of Bones is going to be a wise man or a fool. I'm going to leave everything to him. I don't know if he's going to splurge and just squander everything I've given him, not have a dime, not have a thing to show for it after, you know, three, five years after I die. Yet shall he have rule over all my labor, wherein I have labored. And wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. Alright, verse 20. Therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. This is pessimism. Meaning there's only evil in the world. He said in verse 20, Ecclesiastes 2.20. Therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. Calls my heart. You can... Uh, when you want to despair, you can. When you want to rejoice, you can. Paul said before King Agrippa in Acts 26, 1 and 2, uh, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth a hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa. I think myself happy. You've got to learn to think. I'm going to be joyful and happy and think on things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of a good report. Philippians 4, 8. Just as you control your body of what you do or don't do, you've got to control your mind of what you think on and what you don't think on. Now, the devil can put thoughts in your mind, but as the old saying says, you know, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from building a nest in your hair. All right? So the devil might put things in your head, but you say, get thee behind me, Satan. Get out of here, devil. I'm thinking on things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and of a good report. A good report. Therefore, I went about to cause my heart to despair. You can cause your heart to despair by what you think about. You can cause your heart to despair by the decisions you make. A lot of people have caused their heart to despair by the unwise decisions that they've made in their life. Uh, I don't know if I can say most people, probably can say most people, but at least a lot of people, a lot of stuff we bring upon ourselves. A lot. Now, there's, there's things that happen to us that, you know, we don't deserve, and there's things that happen that other people might say or do, or circumstances or situations that we get into that's not fair, you know, this and that. But a lot of things, a lot of the condition that people are in, it's because of unwise decisions unwise concerning marriage, who they married, unwise concerning financial decisions, those are the two biggest ones. I mean, think about it. Think about people's lives. If you get through them two right there, if you get through the marriage thing and you marry the person and you live happily ever after, and you get married and, you, and so forth, and then you've got your finances halfway in line where you're not 
acting like a fool with money. Uh, you, you think about it, you conquered a lot of life there. Now, there might be some other things with your kids and grandkids and disappointments and heartaches. and you know I understand all that, but I'm just saying, if you get, but a lot of times people, you know, they, the marriage thing, they got 50,000 problems in their marriage thing, all right? Especially if you have children with somebody uh, that you are not married to now, and uh, you got all kinds of problems there, and then financially, you make bad financial decisions on top of that through the years, and then you're, you know, in a mess there. So, you know, it, it's financial decisions, and that's why Proverbs is written, that's why Ecclesiastes is written, that's why the Bible's written. People don't understand. And God's not trying to be mean. He's saying there's a blueprint for your life that if you'll follow what I say in this Bible concerning every area of your life, for the most part, you can have an abundant, joyful, peaceful life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there'll be some hard knocks. There'll be some trials. Everybody goes through trials. But uh, I think myself happy, King Agrippa. Now, Job, turn back a few pages to the left there, Job, uh, a couple, three books. Job chapter 7. Job talks about this right before Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Uh, Job 7, 1. Uh, Job kind of talks about this kind of stuff that Solomon does. Job 7, 1. Is there not an appointed time to man upon earth? Are not his days also like the days of an hireling? Job 7, 2. As a servant earnestly desireth the shadow... And as an hireling looketh for the reward of his work, so am I made to possess months of vanity, and wearisome nights are appointed unto me. Uh, appointed to me. When I lie down, I say, When shall I arise? And the night be gone. And I am full of tossings to and fro until the dawning of the day. My flesh is clothed with worms and clods of dust. My skin is broken and become loathsome. My days are swifter than a weaver's show and are spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is wind. Mine eye shall no more see good. Now, Job is saying that. <clears throat> uh, Job got like this because of suffering. All right, Solomon got like this because of idolatry. All right, Solomon's away from God. So there's definitely, he's going to feel like there isn't any hope and everything's vanity and empty and void and everything else. Now, Job got this way because he gets, all ten of his kids are dead. He's got sore boils from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. He's lost all of his possessions. He's the uh, greatest man, richest man in the East, it says in Job chapter 1. And he's got, he's lost his health, he's lost his wealth. His wife says, what, curse God and die. I mean, this guy's in a mess because of suffering. He's saying these things. All right, back to Ecclesiastes 2, uh, 21. Ecclesiastes 2, 21. For there is a man whose labor is in wisdom and in knowledge and in, in equity. Uh, 21, he says, there is a man whose labor is in wisdom and in knowledge. He's talking about himself. And in equity. Equity is like equality, fairness, having the right balance. All right? Yet to a man that hath not labored therein shall he leave it for his portion. This also is vanity and great evil. All right? Uh, what he's saying there is, is uh, yet to a man. Verse 21, he says, yet to a man that hath not labored. Talk about his son Rehoboam. He acts like he resents leaving this stuff for his son. This guy is in love with everything he's got. Hey, man. I, mean, I don't have what Solomon's got, believe me. Not even close. But if I, whatever I got, hey, after I'm gone, I'm in heaven. Kids can have it. I hope they use their head, you know. There ain't much to use their head about, though. But, but anyways, yet to a man, his son Rehoboam, he's saying he's not going to be wise enough to handle it, and that's just what happened. 
What Solomon left Rehoboam, you can read in 1 Second Kings, 1 Second Chronicles, Rehoboam fouled up. Solomon fouled up too in 1 Kings 11. But Rehoboam fouled up even worse, his son. Read, you can read about Rehoboam in Kings, Chronicles. Uh, Rehoboam took the counsel of the youth, the young, instead of the counsel of the aged, the elderly, and brought about even more destruction and division in the kingdom. Uh, you can read about that in 2 Chronicles 10, verses 1 to 15. 2 Chronicles chapter 10, verses 1 to 15. It talks about Rehoboam taking the counsel of the young instead of the elder, the aged. All right, verse 22. For what, what hath man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart wherein he hath labored under the sun? Uh, well, a Christian has plenty. He says in 22, he's asking a question. For what hath man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart Wherein he hath labored under the sun. Well, a Christian has plenty. Uh, what hath man of all his labor? He has honor and glory. 1 Peter 1 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. He has honor and glory. He earns the reward of the inheritance, according to Colossians 3 24, by working for God. By getting up and getting at it each day, working your job and and uh, and being faithful to God, he gets rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. The Christian does. First Corinthians three six to fourteen, and our labor, a born again Christian's labor, is all through this book so far. The first two chapters, he's word, used the word labor all what, ten times at least. Labor's in vain. Labor, my labor's in vain. My labor, my labor, my labor's in vain. Labor, labor, labor. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In the Lord. Our labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's not vanity. It's not futile. It's not empty. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. See? You know what one preacher said? I don't know. He might be right a little bit. I don't know if it's totally right. He said, you want to, know why, you want to know why there's so many people on welfare? Because they've come to the conclusion that labor is vain. Especially today, they're paying you not to work. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> there's no work ethic anymore. Years ago, there was. And the government pays people not to work. They tax you to death and then give it to people who don't want to work. Yeah. If that don't make you mad in a hornet, mm -hmm. you must be mm -hmm. spiritually dead. Ecclesiastes 2.23. So 22, the question for it, what hath a man of all his labor? Well, and of the vexation of his heart, wherein he hath labored under the sun? Well, he's got a lot of things. I just gave him to you. 23, a born-again Christian that's in the will of God, and serving God, and walking with God, and fellowship with God. 23, for all his days are sorrows. Yeah, if you're not right with God, they are, Solomon. For all his days are sorrows and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This also is vanity. All right, now this here in 23 is fatalism. Fatalism. F-A-T-A-L-I-S-M. Fatalism. All right? Uh, if all that a person lives for is the things of this life, and he's going to leave it to somebody, and he doesn't know what they're going to do with it. It's vanity, Solomon says. It's vanity. I, I talked with a preacher recently. I won't tell you his name. I believe some of you know him. He told me that his wife, his wife is one of uh, four children. And uh, these people are in their 60s. And this preacher and his wife. And he was several years ago. Uh, the mother-in-law didn't like this preacher because he was a Bible-believing preacher. <coughs> she professed to be saved, but whatever. 
And she didn't have a lot, but what she left, I think she totaled probably about 50 or 60, 70,000 or something like that total. But she left the house and all her assets to the one son who's been a drug addict all his life. How about them apples, honey? You say, preacher, you might not know the whole story, the whole family, what went on, this that. I'm telling you what he told me. The only reason why he didn't, she didn't leave this preacher's wife, which is one of the kids, anything, is because she married this Bible-believing preacher, and she never did like him. And the other, I don't know what the deal was with the other two kids, but <coughs> I think there was two boys and two girls, or three boys and a girl. I don't know. I can't remember. But anyways, that's what he said. He said, brother, she didn't leave us a dime. And left this guy who's done drugs for years. Won't go to work. She likes him. Ain't got a brain in her head, honey. I'd tell her that if I ever saw her. Uh, it's vanity, you see. Uh, he's, saying, he's saying here in verse 23, For all his days are sorrows and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This also is vanity. He's saying life is a cycle. You work, you earn, you spend, you collect, you purchase, you work, you earn, you pay, you repair, you fix, you trade, blam, then you go to the grave. What do you say? Hey man, without God, life is a humdrum. And I'm going to tell you what, when I got saved since 1977, when I got born again, I've had some terrible disappointments. I've had some trials that knock your feet off. I've had a few things. And I'm going to tell you what. I still have the joy of the Lord in Amen. my heart. Amen. Still have the peace of God that passes all understanding. Amen. Even through the most severe times in the last 44 years. That's the conclusion the Solomon's come to after research. I've got about seven minutes. Uh, chapter 2, verse 24. Uh, 23 says, For all his days are sorrows, and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. He can't even sleep. His heart doesn't take rest in the night. Hey, your heart's got to take rest at night. You've got to sleep. You've got to have some good night's sleep. That's good for your body, good for your brain, good for your body, yep. your well-being. This is also vanity. 24, there is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw, that it was from the hand of God. Now this is degeneration. Uh, degeneration. It's, it's pure Epicureanism. Uh, 24, he says, there is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink they should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. All right, if a man, a woman is saved, verse 24 is good. To, uh, to do what? That you should eat and drink, that you should make your soul enjoy good in your labor. That's There's nothing wrong with that. A good day's work, all right? An honest day's work, and you get your paycheck, you pay your bills. You know, if any provide not for his own, he's denied the faith. He's worse than an infidel, 1 Timothy 5, 8. God wants us to do that. We have to pay our bills and you got to work and uh, you got to have an income. And uh, so if a person is saved, verse 24 is good. But for a man under the sun, that's degeneration. See? And uh, look at uh, Deuteronomy 14 26. For some reason, I got these verses written down here. Uh, Deuteronomy 14 26. The Bible says. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. 
and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. In other words, enjoy your life and uh, and work. And there's nothing wrong with working and buying yourself something. Buying yourself some nice things. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Deuteronomy 14, 26. And then Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. Deuteronomy 28, uh, verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, and if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed, blessed, all down through there. I mean, the Lord will bless them, see? The blessings for obedience to the Old Testament Mosaic Law. All right? So I'm talking about the, the blessings of God there. So, uh, Back to Ecclesiastes 2, finishing up this chapter, if we can here. Chapter 2, verse 25. For who can eat, or who else can hasten hereunto more than I? That's egotism. Who can eat, or who else can hasten hereunto more than I? In other words, I mean, you know, I've got everything. He's saying. 26. For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail. The way of transgressors is hard, it says in Proverbs 15, 13. To gather and to heap up, that he may give to him that is good before God. This is also his vanity and vexation of spirit. All right? In other words, this is pragmatism. This is pragmatism. And uh, because the good man dies like the sinner, what he's saying here, without God or expectation of any eternal reward or eternal value, what good is it? He's saying, verse 26, for God giveth to a man... Uh, that is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail. Not only the unsaved person, but a person that's saved and not living right. He's not a sinner in the sense of being lost, but you know, living, the way of transgressors is hard. All right, sin. And I got a message I preached here years ago. Uh, the way of transgressors is hard. And uh, all about transgressors, sin. All right, uh, a couple minutes here. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. All right, now, season is mentioned several times in the Bible. And uh, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose. Now, those words, times and seasons, are used in the Bible. Uh, they're used over and over again in relation to prophetic events. Uh, the, the disciples come to Jesus and ask him, without this time restore again the kingdom to Israel in Acts 1 6. In Acts 1 7, he said, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Times and seasons usually has to do first Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, he talked about the rapture. And the next verse, 5 1, 1 Thessalonians 5 1, he talked about by the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Times and seasons. And that's why life is. There's just, there, life has seasons. Life is like a clock. You, you physically go through different things physically as you age. All right? A person's, you know, they start out, they're five years old or ten years old, a boy or a girl. They get to teenage years, you know, hormones start settling in and everything, you know, and, uh, and then they get 20, and, you know, and then, uh, a 20-year-old is different than a 30-year-old. All right? 30 to 40, that decade, that decade there. 30 to 40, when you're 40, you're not what you were when you were 30. When you're 50, you're not 40. When you're 60, you're not 50. When you're 70, you're not 60. The clock of life, biological clock, there's a season and a time. Amen? And uh, see, there's a season for sin. Hebrews 11, 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. There's a, a season of sowing and reaping, all right, and a time. To everything, there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. All right? Uh, times and seasons. 
Uh, I got some other stuff here. I don't need to go on. I need a softener. That's 55 minutes. All right. Are there